there was one instructor there who kept coming over to me and she said, you know, you want to get out here, you know, you want to do this. And I'm thinking, oh man, I'm like, at that point I was, I don't know, 32 or something. And I'm going, you know, I'm just going to sit and watch my kids. Well, when they were probably maybe green belts, purple belts, so early into the, the intermediate ranks, I think, we went to watch a black belt test because the Ernie Reyes organization has two black belt tests a year and it's a big production. Mm. And so we went to the San Jose Civic Auditorium to see this black belt test. And I saw other women there in their 30s testing for black belt and I thought, you know, I've been an athlete all my life. I was a competitive swimmer for years. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to have something to do with the kids. And so that was the genesis of it was summer of 1994. And it was really just to have something fun to do with my kids. Mm -hmm. Never in a million years thinking about, you know, getting a black belt or multiple, you know, degrees or owning a school, nothing like that. So um, I did you know, just pour myself into it. And I found it to be something that I absolutely loved. I loved the camaraderie. I loved the way that it changed my body, my mind. And I can, I'll tell you one story. One time I had um, dinner with a friend who I hadn't seen in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I was probably a blue belt at that point. So, you know, I'd been training for a couple of years and we met for a rest at a restaurant. She was already seated and I walked in and, you know, hugged her and sat down and she looked at me and she goes, what happened to you? I said, oh my gosh, you know, what do you mean? She goes, you look completely different. Like you walk differently. Like everything about you is different. And I said, well, I, I started martial arts and it just became more and more that the positive changes in my life, I could relate back to my training and mindset and the support that I got from exceptional teachers, um, from my, my classmates, the people I trained with, um, and just from the way it changed, you know, who I was. Hello everyone, welcome back to Conversations from the Heart. Today we are joined by Master Via Nueva, the author of Don't Fight Math, The Black Belt's Journey to Recapturing Joy. Ma'am, thanks for coming on the show. Welcome. Thank you so much for having me. It's a delight. Yeah, no, it's our pleasure. I mean, um, your book was awesome and we had a ton of fun reading it. It was very illuminating and sounds like you've been through a lot of hardship and through it all you've really overcome and that's just so impressive you know we have a lot of um women at our school training and i think a book like yours uh can be a, a great inspiration to them to, to yeah. do better and to keep pushing through and and to overcome um i got to meet you a little ways back when i went to pick up some things at your school um, but I, and I got to learn about you a little bit more from your book, but for those that don't know about you and your many accolades and accomplishments, can you tell them a little bit about how you got started in the martial arts and, and where you're at today? Yeah, I'd love to. And thank you again for having me. This is really, really special. Mm -hmm. um, I started martial arts. I was not one of those kids who did martial arts and I actually had never really thought about doing it. Um, but my children back in, believe it or not, 1994, so my uh, my daughter was 13, she was in the eighth grade, and the boys were eight, uh, 10 and 8, and um, she got into this silly little pushing fight at school, and um, my parents flipped out, and they said, the kids need to know how to protect themselves, find a martial arts school, we'll pay for the first year. Mm. And so I was in San Jose back in California and started looking around at different schools because I had no idea where to look. And I found the Ernie Reyes organization, which at that time was strictly Taekwondo. Mm. And so I visited one of the schools. I met with the instructor who was at that time only a third degree black belt mm. and was really impressed by their approach to martial arts, that it wasn't really only about kicking and punching, but that there was leadership and character development that they felt was really, really important. And so I enrolled all three of the kids 
And I would sit on the sidelines with all the other moms and I would watch them out there. And, and I loved the fact that they really stressed um, friendliness and that, you know, the kids all had to bow to the little kids and to the instructors. It wasn't a, this hierarchical thing. I mean, they, they honored rank, but they, but they always said, you know, you can learn something from a four-year-old. Mm -hmm. So treat them with respect. You bow, you give them a polite greeting. And so I'm watching this and I'm really, really impressed by this. And there was one instructor there who kept coming over to me and she said, you know, you want to get out here, you know, you want to do this. And I'm thinking, oh man, I'm like, at that point, I was, I don't know, 32 or something. And I'm going, you know, I'm just going to sit and watch my kids. Well, when they were probably maybe green belts, purple belts. So early into the, the intermediate ranks, I think we went to watch a black belt test because the Ernie Reyes organization has two black belt tests a year and it's a big production. Mm. And so we went to the San Jose Civic Auditorium to see this black belt test. And I saw other women there in their thirties testing for black belt. And I thought, you know, I've been an athlete all my life. I was a competitive swimmer for years. And I thought, you know what? I'm going to give it a try. I'm going to have something to do with the kids. And so that was the genesis of it was summer of 1994. And it was really just to have something fun to do with my kids. Mm -hmm. Never in a million years thinking about, you know, getting a black belt or multiple, you know, degrees or owning a school, nothing like that. So um, I did, you know, just pour myself into it. And I found it to be something that I absolutely loved. I loved the camaraderie. I loved the way uh, it changed my body, my mind. And I can, I'll tell you one story. One time I had um, dinner with a friend who I hadn't seen in a couple of years. Mm -hmm. And I was probably a blue belt at that point. So, you know, I'd been training for a couple of years and we met for a rest at a restaurant. She was already seated and I walked in and, you know, hugged her and sat down and she looked at me and she goes, what happened to you? I said, oh my gosh, you know, what do you mean? She goes, you look completely different. Like you walk differently. Like everything about you is different. And I said, well, I, I started martial arts and it just became more and more that the positive changes in my life, I could relate back to my training and mindset and the support that I got from exceptional teachers, um, from my, my classmates, the people I trained with. Um, and just from the way it changed, you know, who I was. And one of the other things that I, I noticed, you know, and this is three and a half years later when I'm getting ready to test for my first degree black belt. And I was unfortunately going through a really ugly divorce mm -hmm. and was, was just clinging to my training really as the thing that kind of got me through it. Mm. And there was one point, um, it, because we have to journal uh, West coast. One of the things you have to do is you have to journal and your instructor has to, you know, read your journal and all of that. And so mm. I had been journaling like crazy. And there was one day that I just thought, you know what? I can't, I can't do this. I am. I'm, I just can't do this, this is too much. And I took two days off and I can remember sitting in a Starbucks and I'm flipping through my journal and I'm realizing that in the past 31 days, I had gone to 40 classes. Plus I had been running, plus I'd been doing all my pushups and my set. I mean, I had just been over training mm -hmm. and I just started laughing at myself and went, oh my goodness. And I'm writing in my journal, you know, like, okay, chill out. And then Two days later, I'm thinking, man, I wonder if I could get my second degree by the time I'm 40. <laughs> it just You go through those loops. And I always tell my students, because of course I make them journal as well. Mm. One of the delightful things about these journals is that years and years later, you go back and you read them and you see where you were and mm. what your training meant for you and what you gleaned from it. And it's really, really fantastic for me, especially to look back, you know, 20, almost 30 years ago and see the metamorphosis really that was happening. And so I'll even tell my, you know, 10, 12 year old students, I know it's a pain. You don't want to take that out and write down, you know, what you ate and how many pushups you did and tell me how you're feeling. But yeah. trust me, just trust me in 10 years, this is going to be gold for you. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I bet those journals were somewhat helpful in writing this book because there's a lot of 
your story and progress and stuff kind of encapsulating these life lessons. Very much so. Very much so. I'm a big fan of journaling. I started journaling back in college because I was an English major. And my okay. teacher told me, if you want to be good at writing, you have to read voraciously and you have to write. It doesn't matter what you write, but you just need to write every day. And so I started writing and I would be embarrassed if anyone opened my journals because some days it's like, I am writing. <laughs> it's just to get my pen moving, you know? But, um, Such yeah. a great discipline. It's really a fantastic discipline. I do the same thing. And you write very well. I mean, I read through your book and you have very good, clean prose. And uh, Thank you. Um, so, you know, I kind of think maybe the best place to start is you were talking about how you were kind of sitting on the sidelines as a, as a mom and then you saw um you know what your kids are doing and that's so typical of all of our parents you know every one of them that comes in I just see it in their eyes they're just burning <laughs> to get out there but they, they don't have the confidence to um push themselves out on the floor and I don't like to push too hard because we sometimes we, we we push a little bit and then the parent gets out there and they get scared and then they pull the kid off the floor you know so oh, yeah. um it's it's a little bit of a balance but I'm always like man if I could just get those those parents onto the floor successfully launched for a couple of weeks they're gonna fall in love with this completely and in your book your first principle is get in the ring um you know one question i have is you know what do you think the main reason keeping people out of that ring is especially for those adults that are kind of sitting on the sidelines yeah i it's such a good question i honestly think it's fear you know, when we're, one of the things I talk about in the book is when we're little kids, like we are just open to experience. We're risk takers. We want to run away. You know, we want, put me down, put me down. I want to do it myself kind of thing. Mm -hmm. But as life goes on and things come up and you have setbacks or you have tragedy, you start kind of retrenching. And I think, you know, when you think about something like martial arts in particular, like it's just so out there. It's not a team sport. It's not like if you drop the ball, somebody else is going to pick it up. It's all you. And you're on the mat and you're facing an, a, an instructor who, you know, maybe is your age or maybe it's someone like you, sir, who's, you know, much younger than I am. You're thinking, I'm going to look like an idiot. I'm uncoordinated or I've never done this. And, you know, I'm wearing this uniform. Do I have it strapped correctly? Did I tie my belt right? I mean, all of those things that just crash on us and it just makes it so much easier to be a spectator mm -hmm. and yet life is not lived in the in the in the cheap seats <laughs> it's lived on the mat and so yeah it's 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 a difficult thing to do to take that first step and mm -hmm. get in the ring yes, yeah i sometimes think it's easier to get in the ring when you're young and it's sometimes harder to do it later because you've had so much sort of anxiety that's been built up over the years so much self-doubt and it's just one more reason why kids should start young and they should you know do martial arts because it's the kind of thing that yeah they're going to learn to defend themselves and, and and whatnot and they're going to get in shape but the most important thing to take away are those leadership life skills that you were talking about because that's what's going to put them on the right path to be successful outside of the martial arts. Not everyone has to be a martial arts instructor like us, but um, they can use those skills in their other jobs. And to really Without stop. a doubt. I mean, when you think about things like, you know, leadership and integrity, but I think about things like courage. Mm -hmm. You know, the very first time that you step on the mat to do a sparring class, mm -hmm. it takes courage. I had one little guy I remember who was so excited about sparring. He couldn't wait to start sparring. He was like six. Mm -hmm. It was when my little dragons program. And so he goes and he picks out all his sparring gear and he gets all the red gear and he's super, super excited. And the first day comes and he will not even put it on, mm -hmm. will not put his gear on, won't step on the mat. He's crying. He's sitting on his mom's lap on the chairs. And I said, you know what? That's fine. You can just sit here and watch this time couple days later, he comes and he's willing to sit on the mat, still won't put his gear on, but he'll sit in the corner of the mat and he'll watch. Mm -hmm. Well, this literally took weeks before we would get him to put his gear on, but he would sit and watch. Finally, finally, the day comes when he's willing to give it a try and he gets out there and he tears everybody up, goes to a tournament a month later, gets a trophy that's taller than he is. <laughs> you know it's just, but that right there, I mean, that's a lesson 
at six years old that will never leave him for his life. Mm. You know, yeah. you don't, maybe you didn't have the courage to run headlong out into the ring and just start. And maybe it took you several weeks, but you know what? You did it and you were successful. And now nobody can take that away. I mean, yeah, could I have dragged him out there and made a big deal of it? Sure. Mm. But instead he now has a skill and a confidence that I couldn't make him have. He had to get it for himself. Yeah. You know, sometimes it's best to just jump in blindly. And um, I am reminded when I was younger, I I love sparring. I've always really loved sparring, but I felt like everyone kind of loved sparring more back in the day. And then um, <laughs> I started training at schools where we had to buy sparring gear. And then when you, when you have to buy sparring gear, you have to coordinate the day you're going to spar so that everyone brings their sparring gear on that day. And what would end up happening it's, a, it's actually a problem that we have to this day at our school, which is that like half the students show up on spar day because everyone's scared to spar. Yep. And um, I remember back in the day, and I'm, I'm thinking about it, and maybe the reason why so many people like sparring is a similar story to this boy you're talking about is we didn't have our own sparring gear. The, well, mostly we didn't wear sparring gear, but the <laughs> sparring gear that we did was just a chest protector and, and the master had them in the back and you just drag them out, throw them on the floor and we just put them on, you know, so it could happen at any time. And so you just had no idea. And then once he was done, you're like, oh, you know, I like sparring, you know, but the, yeah. almost the idea of it is like more disabling than anything. Mm -hmm. um, so true. It's so true. I mean, I got to where I told my students, you have your gear with you every class. Your bag comes with you every single class because you never know what's going to happen. And, you know, my instructor back in San Jose, um, he <laughs> he had that that mentality. And especially with the black belt class, we had to show up with everything every single day. Mm -hmm. And I remember there was one time that I showed up and I had all my gear and everything. He goes, OK, get your running shoes. We're going for a run. And I was like, it was the middle of summer in California. I was wearing flip flops. And he was like, wow, oh, sucks to be you. Come on, we're going. And we went for a three mile run and I'm running in flip flops because that's what you, it wasn't like I was going to say no. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so I never, ever, ever showed up without running shoes in my bag again. It's awesome. That's great. So this makes me think, uh, moving on to the kind of second principle that you talk about, this is get in the right ring. So get in the ring, but get in the right ring. I think about this uh, story about you know, the six-year-old, and if you would have said, all right, you know, young man, go in there, and we're going to spar today, and it's a class full of adults, right, and he's the only six-year-old, like, how much longer it might have taken to get him onto the floor, if he got onto the floor at all. Yes. And I'm reminded yes, of your book, and how you're talking about, you know, you don't want to just go out to a competition, which you're kind of setting yourself up to lose, you know, you want to go to put yourself in a situation where you have at least a good chance of winning because you need to build up that confidence. And that reminds me of like, you know, I've seen different coaching styles with people when they take their students to tournaments and mm. the worst coaching style is this. Okay. Come over here. Let's get you ready for uh, your competition. And then the instructor just beats the crap out of the student. It's like, Oh my God, like, what are you trying to do? Like you're, you're trying to build up their confidence and get them mentally prepared to go into the ring I mean, what I do is I go out there and I say, come on, beat me up. Like, you know, I just kind of move around with them yep. and let them yep. build confidence, you know, so that they can get into the ring. Um, and I think life is about, we say, like, put one foot in the fire. Mm -hmm. If you if you put both feet in the fire, a lot of times you get burned. <clears throat> um, and that can be analogy used in different ways, like intensity, but it could also be like, don't um, let yourself just get totally buried under the difficulty um, because yeah. if you do that, then you'll um, you'll adopt a can't do mentality that can really push you down. And I really think the people in life who are successful, they've just ridden successes up and they never had too many failures. And so they just build this positivity. And then the, a lot of times people will be building it up and then they'll hit some wall and then they start building down. And if they can just remember that it's just all about building that chain of, of success, yeah. they can get back to where they were before. 
You're absolutely right. You're absolutely right. I, I think it's so important to have to, to build those small successes so that you can grow into the bigger ones. And, and I think that we do the same thing with, when it comes to sparring. And I'll do a drill where if I have, say, say I have an all belt class, which is unusual, but say I have an all belt class and they're sparring, I'll have them match up first with someone, you know, their own belt rank. So maybe there's 10 people on each side. And we do a two minute round and say it's it's hands only or it's feet only or it's hands and feet, whatever it is. But we go, we do a two minute round, stop, face each other, 10 out, and then we say and switch. And so one line stays still, but the other line, the head person runs down to the end and they all move up. So now this person who would have probably been like a third or fourth degree black belt is now down here with a blue belt. Mm -hmm. and they know that when you are with someone who's that dramatically different from you in rank, you're teaching. Uh -huh. And if I catch you doing what you're talking about, man, you're going to be doing push-ups for the next 45 minutes and I'm taking your belt for a week. So they know, you know, that they're teaching. And so it's so beautiful because it's part of their leadership training. Uh -huh. It's so beautiful to see them when they're down on this end, these fourth degree guys, they're going at it. I mean, they're tearing each other up. It's, it's a beautiful thing to watch. And then as you get towards the middle where they're starting to kind of mix where the red belts are maybe with the black belts and down here, the black belts are with the blue, whatever. And you start seeing the differences and it's just a lovely, lovely thing to see when somebody's imparting knowledge and building someone else up and you see you know the blue belt who actually scores on a black belt and their eyes light up and they're just you know oh my goodness and it's just a really really lovely thing to see I think that's super super important the other thing I will say though is you know we we often will will want to put ourselves in a ring that's difficult and then it's demoralizing mm -hmm. but something that's equal moralizing is getting into a ring that's too easy for you mm -hmm. because even when you win or you success, when you walk away you don't feel good about it and the idea here when when I'm talking about getting in the right ring is get in the ring where even if you lose you feel good about it because you did your best you learned something and if you win you feel great but if you go into a ring that's too easy for you you walk away and you're like, man, I don't feel good. And that really truly is not a success you're going to want to build on because you start to feel embarrassed and demoralized. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And, and also, you know, you're not pushing yourself to achieve your very best and you exactly. get kind of admired in mediocrity. You got to yes. push yourself to rise above for sure. Absolutely. Yep. So moving into kind of the next principle, which is get prepared. Uh, talking about getting in the right ring, I'm thinking about context, right? And how, whether it's martial arts or whether it's, you know, outside the dojong situation, um, being able to discern where the right ring is or what that ring looks like. I think for myself, I think about my experiences and it depends a lot on the people around me. Um, and having that context of, hey, you know, I, I, I may have done this before, or maybe this is new to me, um, and just having conversations around, do you think that this is a place for me to be? Or sometimes it's very much, you know, just jump in head first and, and go for it and find out. Uh, but in terms of preparation, getting prepared, something that you say in the book at the end of that chapter is what should I be doing to train my mind, body, and spirit, right? And in martial arts, this makes a lot of sense, but in life as a whole, you know, how do we train ourselves every day for people who aren't martial artists or for people who, you know, exercise isn't their favorite thing to do? Um, what, what does that preparation and training look like? Yeah, super good question, because it's one thing to mentally decide, I'm going to get in the ring and to discern which one to get into. But, you know, as we talk about, if you get into the ring and you don't have your gear on, or you haven't trained in a month, you're not going to do well. And it's not going to be indicative of your real abilities. It's just going to, it's just going to knock you on your butt, basically. And the same thing is with life. You know, for me, when I, uh, when I got divorced, I realized, 
you know, I've got to keep a roof over my head. I, my daughter had left home by that point, but I still had my boys and I had not finished college. And so I went back to school because that for me was preparation for getting into that ring of needing to have a good job of needing to be able to provide for my children. So, you know, I worked all day long and then at night I went to school, you know, training is never going to be something that's just super easy. Martial arts training isn't just something that you kind of do for fun. No, there's days you don't want to be there. There's days that it hurts. There's days that it's a struggle. Same thing with anything that you want to do in life. For me, going to school at night wasn't fun. You know, I mean, I enjoyed learning and it was a great, it was a great opportunity. But, you know, when you work 40, 50 hours a week, and then you know you've got 20 hours worth of schoolwork to do on top of that, and you're trying to raise a family, and I was training in martial arts, and you know you're trying to have time with friends or family or whatever. I mean, it's a lot. You make sacrifices. But if you truly want to be prepared to succeed in whatever ring you've chosen, suck it up. Make the sacrifice. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Great advice. Sometimes hard to hear, but it's, but it's true. <laughs> and you know, and the thing of it is, it's so worth it. It's so completely worth it. And when you do, when you make sacrifices and then you achieve something, whether it's in martial arts or it's in life, there's nobody who can take that feeling away from you. Mm. Nobody. Like I, somebody could steal my black belt. Mm they can't steal my black belt. Mm -hmm. Like I achieved that. Mm -hmm. I know what that feels like. I know what it feels like at the end of six days when I am 10 pounds lighter than I was when I started because we've been eating rice cakes and drinking water and eating bananas and sleeping on the ground and carrying 400 pound logs through the streets of San Francisco and at the end of the whole thing, nobody could have given me that feeling. I had to grab that feeling. And as a result, nobody can steal that from me. No one can ever take that away from me. And that's one of the things that I tell my students. I can't want this more than you do. Mm. I want this for you. I'm going to provide you all the training and all the opportunities to get it. Mm. I can't want it more than you do. Your parents can't want it more than you do. And when they come out on the other side and you see that look on their face, <coughs> excuse me, and they've achieved it, mm -hmm. it's beautiful. Yeah. Yeah, it's like yeah. um, you can't take that away from you because the what things mean to you comes directly from the hard work and dedication that you put into earning that thing. You know, you, some schools, it might take... 10 years to get a black belt and another school might take like one year right, and right. if you got a black belt in one year it wouldn't mean nearly as much as it would mean if it took you 10 years to get a black belt and this in, in schools that i've trained at, i've trained in many different styles and many different schools and you know some of them incredibly rigorous and difficult to earn rank and then other schools much more easy mm -hmm. and in schools where it's like really easy to earn rank and you earn a new belt like every couple months those don't mean anything you yeah. know, like they don't, they don't, the only thing that people care about are maybe the black belt or maybe a couple degrees of black belt. Mm. Um, whereas schools that, you know, it's like really hard to earn even the first belt. It's like, oof, man, we start looking at those couple belts up. You're like, those belts mean a lot. Yeah. And that Absolutely. whole meaning is coming from the same place you're talking about. The meaning of the, the work that was put into earning it. So it doesn't even matter the actual item um, yeah. or anything like that. Yes, sir. I totally agree. I love the the moment when the promotion happens and it's a really well-deserved promotion. And you know, I think about even our white belt students that are maybe testing for the first time or maybe they get their first merit on their belt. And the first one is like, wow, this is really cool. This is really like I've never done this before. Okay, this is cool. But then that second merit comes and it's like, oh okay now I'm <laughs> understand like what this feeling is and then that first belt comes and at the end you know all the yellow belts come in they're standing a little taller they're like wow this is great it's and that's that's just the beginning beautiful. so continuing along that path and uh, it's seeing... it's so beautiful i agree and in, in our system orange belt is the second belt and 
when you get them through that first belt test, mm. it, it's done. You know, I mean, it's like we all go through that, you know, oh, I'm taking martial arts. And you get to that point where you're like, oh, I'm a martial artist. Mm -hmm. And, you know, for our students, I usually see that somewhere around blue belt, brown belt, you know, when they're starting to edge into the advanced belts, it's not like, oh, yeah, I take karate, you know, but it's like, oh, I'm a martial artist. It's a, it's a, it's a personality. It's a mindset switch and it's fantastic. Yes, well, it's really when you make the switch from, oh, this is something I'm trying out. It could be a fun hobby to, I self-identify as a martial artist and yes. I'm for the rest of my life. Yeah. I, I try to tell people, you know, who are trying to get in shape that that's kind of your goal. You know, I mean, it could be getting in shape. It could be learning leadership life skills. It could be learning how to defend yourself or whatever it is, uh, your, whatever your fitness goal is, it's like, you want to get to the point where you self-identify, like I'm a yogi, you know, I'm a martial artist, you know, because when you get to that point, it's like when you're, well, I'm going to do this probably for the rest of my life, you know, um, Jesse plays guitar. And even though he's a martial arts instructor now, I, I probably think that he's going to play guitar for the rest of his life just because he's done that for so long. He self-identifies as a guitarist. Yeah. Um, and I think we all do that. So totally. Yeah. Okay, uh, transitioning now, as we move up through the ranks, as we get into these situations where we're saying, okay, like I'm starting to identify, inevitably something is going to swing at us and that leads us to get comfortable with punches, right? Getting comfortable with, all right, I'm feeling good, I'm doing mm -hmm. good, I'm in the right ring, I'm prepared, and then wham, here comes that hit and you go, ooh, that didn't <laughs> feel very good at all um what do i do in this situation do i retaliate do i let myself get hit do i move out of the way um and what really struck me from that chapter is this idea it's great to remain standing in the face of a flurry of life's punches it's better to fight back so this concept of yeah it's great to have indomitable spirit and you can stand there and get whack boom 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 but is that all there is, right? What does it look like when you take that step to defend yourself, to defend yeah. the people around you, to um, move forward with that? So. It, it, yeah, so good. And I'm really glad that that's what you gleaned from that chapter. You know, when you think about getting in the ring and getting in that right ring, this kind of goes back to not getting into that ring that's too easy for you. So you found yourself in a ring that's not too easy for you, that you actually have to do something to defend yourself. Yes, and that can be in a sparring match, that can be in real life. Um, I know I tell a lot of the stories about, you know, what happened to me at that point in time and my ex-husband, who unfortunately was my, my second husband, and I met in martial arts and we owned the school together and turned out not to be a, a terribly honorable man. And um, you can sit back and just get pummeled, but who wins in that situation? Nobody wins. You, you aren't able to protect the people around you. You don't protect yourself. It demolishes your spirit. And it's terrible for the person who's the bad guy, right? The person who's attacking you just feels empowered. And so rather than lashing out, which kind of goes into the next chapter, but, but recognizing that you have the right to stand up for yourself and to do it in an appropriate way. And, you know, one of the things that I tell my students, you know, when we talk about being bullied or, or those kinds of things at school is that, you know, we start off, we, we do the right thing. We, we talk to somebody who we trust in charge. We talk to an adult who's in charge. We explain what's going on. If nothing happens. Well, the first thing we do is we say, please stop. Yes, ma'am. You know, don't touch me. Don't say that to me, whatever. Then we talk to somebody who's in charge. It's only at the end that if somebody's putting a hand on you, you have every right to defend yourself. That's the whole point of being in martial arts, not being in, you know, knitting class. <laughs> the idea is that if someone puts a hand on you, you stop them from doing that. That doesn't mean you break their arm. That doesn't mean that, you know, you, you know, you split their head open. It means you make them stop what they're doing. And, 
I think that translates into everything in life. You know, if someone is mistreating you at work, if someone is mistreating you at home, you start off and you say, don't, don't talk to me that way. Don't say that thing to me. Um, you might talk to your boss. Hey, look, you know, this person in my office is, is taking credit for my work or is harassing me or is, you know, whatever. And then you take things, you take things into your own hands. And sometimes that means being very confrontational. And frankly, I mean, I hate to be sexist about it, but that's a, a bigger problem for women typically, stereotypically than it is for men. And a lot of times the clients that I work with on leadership, um, I have a, a marketing communications agency called Knockout Marketing Strategies, and I do leadership coaching. And especially for women who are moving from an individual contributor role into a management role, or from a management role to a director role, where now they're directing other managers. Those are kind of pivotal times in careers when it's really important to get comfortable with punches because sometimes you have to be very direct. Sometimes you have to put people in their place. Sometimes you have to be what society might term aggressive. Mm -hmm. um, and, and yet it's really just being authoritative. It's, mm -hmm. it's saying, you know, this is what's right. This is what I will stand for. This is what I won't stand for. Well, it, it takes me back to, you know, many times in my life when people have sort of misunderstood misunderstood violence and how you it's it's like the movies where you could just easily uh intercept the punch redirect it take them down and and, and very gently hold them in position and they're not going to hurt you at all and <laughs> you're like this untouchable master okay that's not how it works guys it's ugly you know even the best in the world could get hit by a straight punch and go down and it's it, you know but and a lot of it is your your mental ferocity. And anyone who's done a lot of sparring will know that, you know, if you have really good footwork, you can play with those white belts like a like a child. Like they go to kick you and like woo woo woo, you're just moving out of the way. But when that white belt finally figures out, hmm, if I just go in berserk <laughs> as hard as I possibly can and just punch 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 punch, I can eventually get through. I can eventually start landing some punches, right? And that's when you have to start stopping them like with your leg and stuff so they can't get in on you okay. and yeah. it's like that's a really good sort of analogy of like how like you know yeah it's great to deflect and avoid and all that kind of stuff but at some point you do have to put up your your offense because the best defense is a good offense mm. so excellent okay you alluded to it a little bit ma'am uh, the next section here is don't fight mad. So here we are, we're taking the punches. A lot of people respond to that kind of pressure with rage, with anger, with, oh, you hit me. I am going to break your arm. I am going to split your head open. I am, I'm coming for you. Right. And as martial artists, as martial arts instructors, you know, when I see a student on the floor starting to get angry, that is where I'm spending the rest of my focus. I'm saying, okay, you know, this, and it's, it doesn't even have to be against another student. We were working on the bags once and there was a newer student in class and he was just getting so upset with himself, like on the edge of tears, angry with himself. He said, I just can't do it. Muttering to himself, I just can't do it. Oh, and, and he kept getting more and more angry. And then he would strike out at the bag and hurt himself and yeah. then get more angry that he hurt himself and then do it again. And I was like, what's going on? And step in and on the side and have that conversation. With him. Hey, you know, we're, we're working on it. We're practicing. You've never done this before. Yes. It's okay. It's okay to go slow and, and move into this, um, this new experience. So oh, I love that. What a great metaphor for life, right? Isn't when it? we go too hard and when we go berserker, who's the person that gets hurt? It's not the bad. It's us. It's us. I, you know, it, it this is so the, the story I tell in the, in the book, I mean, this is really the genesis of the entire book. I was a blue belt mm -hmm. and I was the same. I was that kid. If somebody scored on me, I would get so angry and I would just go harder and faster. Mm -hmm. And I would just, and, and I had an instructor who stopped the match and said, Cindy, don't fight mad. And I've never forgotten that. And that was, you know, 25 years ago. 
but it's so true in life and on the mat. The only person who loses in that situation is me. Mm. And being thoughtful and being deliberate and being methodical and slow and willing to learn, those are the ways that will ultimately make me be successful. And so when I think about what does it mean to not fight mad? It's not just anger. It's how do we react out of, yes, anger, but how do we react out of bitterness or resentment or jealousy or, you know, any of those negative kinds of emotions, a lack of forgiveness, wow. all of those things that spur that reaction versus a response doesn't hurt anybody but me. And so Finding ways to deal with that emotional state will then translate into me being able to throw those punches in a much better way, ultimately coming up with success. But when I'm just throwing stuff, mm. it's, it's, it's just a big mess. It's just a big mess. And it turns out worse in the end because I'm sitting back and I don't feel any better about myself. I'm, I might be embarrassed about the way that I reacted. I might realize that I didn't learn anything. I might realize that I'm no closer to success than I was before this whole big, you know, drama came up. And so for me, it's really important to say, okay, I know right now everything in me wants to just react, mm -hmm. but let's take a deep breath. Let's recognize what's happening inside of me. Let's evaluate the situation and do what I need to do to take care of this before I ever think about what's on the outside. Yeah, you know, one of the things we always talk about when we're sparring is maintaining like a neutral mind. A lot of beginners, they, they say things like, wow, like uh, I never realized it was such a chess match. And grappling is definitely somewhat of a chess match. Oh yeah. Viking yeah. is a chess match too, but one of the things I hear a lot from beginners early, too early on is that they're they're trying to think too hard about what they're going to do next. And as we all know, as we've done martial arts for a long time, is if you're so up here trying to think about things, you cannot That's, perform. And so like, right. you're like, okay, when he throws that back leg roundhouse kick, I'm going to block and I'm going to counter punch. And then he roundhouse kicks you over here and you get knocked out. You're like, oh, wait, why didn't that work? It's because you weren't maintaining your neutral mind. And even with the grappling, it's very important to maintain the neutral mind. Like he starts mm. moving this way, then I move that way, he starts moving this way. And I mean, I, I'm digressing a little bit, but I, I do my, I think through my offense a, a little bit, but I, but I, my defense is mostly just from a neutral instinctual response. Yep. And um, that adaptability is really important in life and <laughs> maintaining that you know don't fight mad like keep calm keep neutral and like if you take that to come conversing with people um one of the things i always talk about with my leadership team is catching people we get people come in from all walks of life all ways of thinking some people come in and they're looking for some real alpha to take them to the next level other people are really soft-spoken and sweet and if you come in too hard you're going to scare them away and so wherever they're coming from, however they think, some people got really weird oddball ideas about the world and how it works. I try to figure it out and I try to catch them, you know, and like kind of guide them to yeah. our program. And that can't be done unless you keep calm and maintain a neutral mindset. If you person comes in, they say something and it offends you. And all of a sudden you go, wait, I can't believe you said that. Then you're going to, you're going to interact with them like this. And if you, you say, okay, like someone says something that offends you, you say, okay, well, we all say offensive things because we're all kind of socially inept at times. I'm just going to let it roll off and, and, and try to figure out where are they coming from and how can I adapt and kind of catch them? Um, yeah. Just another and asking questions is so important. Yes, ma'am. You know, yes. Instead of reacting, asking questions. Hmm, that's interesting. What did you mean by that? Tell me more about that. You know, ordinarily, I I might be offended by that, but you seem like a really nice person. So can you talk a little bit more about that? What did you mean? You, you, anything that just deflates the situation, kind of takes the drama down a notch and allows people to, you know what, actually 
that's not really what I meant. I'm sorry I said that. Here's what I meant. Mm -hmm. You know, anytime we can take it down versus escalating it, I think is super, super important. Absolutely. Yes, ma'am. Specifically, this part of the conversation is reminding me about step sparring. And it's really got me thinking about how step sparring, meaning, okay, one step, and then you go one step, and then we go, okay, maybe two techniques and two techniques, then three and three, four and four. And how important it is, whatever we're doing, to take those steps, especially if it's something we're uncomfortable with, especially if it's something that we keep running into and thinking, man, this just isn't working. This just isn't working out like Master Roland said. Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna block, I'm gonna counter, and then I get kicked over here instead. <laughs> um so just as a personal reminder, I guess for myself taking those steps and looking at situations and okay, I don't have to, you know, look at the house right now and create the ultimate master plan on how every <laughs> facet of my house is going to work today, right? Say, okay, today, sweep the floor, right? And then, and then like, okay, and then just kind of keep, keep moving that in. It's, you know, that's actually one of the things I think that's really important when you think about being prepared or getting prepared mm. is there's nothing wrong with drills. You know, we get bored with drills, but drills are great. Drills save us, whether it's in martial arts or in real life. When you just routinely go over stuff that you're going to face so that when it happens, you're not like, ah, but then you just, your body just reacts, just responds in the right way because you've done it a million times. Um, I was doing some some drills with my black belts the other day where we were just, they were matched up and it was like, okay, somebody throws a reverse punch at your temple. You know, you're going to block Sandan Maki, you're going to reverse punch to the body. You're going to block, you're going to do a defensive side kick. You're going to block, you're going to do a rear leg ground kick. We, we drilled that over and over and over again. And I didn't let them start sparring until we had done basically like blue belt sparring drills for 20 minutes, mm -hmm. but it's really important because then you do just respond in the face of adversity. And I think it's really important in life to kind of go through those scenarios. If something like this were to happen, how would I want to react? How do I want to show up? You know, I might think, oh, I would tell them off and I would never, you know, but how do I want to feel at the end of this engagement mm -hmm. in the end of this altercation when i walk away who do i want to be i want to be a person of integrity i want to be a person who's not embarrassed to turn the corner and run into the mom of one of my four-year-old students mm -hmm. i want to be that person so let's back into it from that what do i need to do in this situation so that at the end of it because it is going to end at the end of it i walk away and i know that i was true to who i want to be Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. That's awesome. Good Coming up of drilling, um, the next section is mix it up. And again, as you were speaking, I'm thinking, okay, drilling, and we, you know, we drill a lot, but there's always, even with drilling, variety. If we came in every single day and we did our basic form, we would all get really, really good at our basic form, but we would let everything else fall away. We'd have like five students. Um, yes, and we would have right? five students. We love the basic form, maybe. Um, I've been in those programs before where we just do forms every day, and it's like, oh, you know, a after like six months or a couple of years, you're just like, oh, can we just do some bag drills? Can we yeah. spice it up? Can we do this in a little different way? Um, so, yes, sir. the question, the quote that I pulled from this chapter. What changes am I willing to make? How big am I willing to go? And just for the sake of keeping it on the mats, you know, sometimes, especially as a fledgling instructor, I'll go out and I'll think, oh, I have a really good idea today. And I go out and I say, all right, everybody, let's try this out. And I go, I, I, I very quickly realized I went too big with this one. <laughs> everybody is confused. Nobody knows what's going on. And I have to dig myself out of this hole. So I'm trying to mix it up, but I just got a little out of hand with it. Well, it the, going back to, you know, one. drilling and the importance of that, it's like when we, we do a lot of role playing in the office and stuff for our leadership team. So people know how to talk about, you know, selling contracts and whatever. 
And um, one of the things that all the, the kids would like, the teenagers like to do when they first come on is to kind of break and then rewind and go back and say it the right way. And I'm like, no, 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 you said that. That's what you said. Now you have to dig yourself out of that hole. Mm, yeah. And it's like when you're teaching a class, like, it, it happens sometimes even now, but I mean, it happened a lot more when I was young and I would be like, okay, we're going to do this. And then I'm like, this is wrong. <laughs> this, I should not have done this. And, but then I have to iterate off of this. Mm. I have to keep iterating because I'll look like I don't know what I'm doing if yeah. I, if I don't stick with this drill. Right. And, um, this is such a, it's a, it's a great experience. It's where you just like, you got to pull up your pants and yeah. you got to get it done, you know, no matter what. Um, mm -hmm. Same thing happens when you're working with kids and you're doing discipline. Like you can't lose that kid. So, you know, when the time comes to do disciplining, you, you got to win that fight every time or your class is slowly going to slide to the side. It, you know, it, that's such a great point is that because it's not just about that kid. It's about everybody who's watching you deal with that kid. Yes. It's easy to get really derailed about the one child, but you got to know you're sending a gigantic beacon broadcast message to everybody else, parents and students alike. Yes. Yes. Yeah. So yeah. And I, you know, it's funny. I, I had an instructor years ago. I was probably, I hadn't gotten my first degree yet. And she was a second degree in Taekwondo. And then I think she had a first degree in Hapkido as well. And she used to train us doing forms. And, you know, we're doing like, say, Paul Gay 2 or something really, really basic. And you're just like, oh, one more time, you know, <laughs> kind of going through this form. But she would, she'd get out the bopper. And this is an adult class. And she'd get out the bopper and she would run around us in circles. You know, okay, you just did this. Why? Because I came after you here. So you're blocking hard. You're like, oh, you didn't like that. Now get me back. Okay, now I'm going to do the punch. Mm -hmm. Oh, now, but there's another guy coming around, swinging around. Oh, I better block that. Oh, but I'm going to get him back, you know? And mm -hmm. each time she walked us through, what am I doing? How am I reacting? And she would run around and then she'd get other instructors there and they're throwing boppers and stuff. And, you know, we're laughing, we're adults, but we're learning in a different way. We're not just going, you know, that you know, so I always try to come up with unique ways. Okay. Now we're going to, everybody you're used to facing the mirror. So we're going to turn 45 degrees this way. Now do your form. We're going to do them back to back. You guys are back to back. You two, you two, you're going to do Paul Gay four, ready, go and yeah. eyes closed. And when you finish, you got to end up back to back again. I mean, just all kinds of stuff to keep it creative and interesting so that it isn't just rote. It's still drills, but it's not boring. Mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. You know, what would you like when you're thinking of mixing it up? Um, one of the things that I think it's really important to have a focus in your life, like wh whatever you want to do. So, if you want to be good at anything, you have to be focused. Yes. For me, that's martial arts. For somebody else, it might be music. I don't know. Uh, whatever you're your interest is and your passion is with life. But I, I think this idea of mixing it up can also just be a great way to empower, to not let yourself get overwhelmed by being singularly focused on one thing. You know, you do need some other hobbies, some other things to kind of put some life and um, recovery in your forward motion. If you're just so obsessed with martial arts and that's all you do, and for you forgo all social life and you know any hobbies and things like that um i think you're gonna make a very brittle strength and some yes. mixing it up i think could be applied in that way as well i love that term that's a really really great notion of brittle strength when you do dabble in other things or experience other things it does create a more flexible adaptable person and that's really where there's strength. I mean, you think about, about a hurricane, you know, living in Florida, I think about hurricanes, you know, and the, 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 the plants that are flexible, no matter how hard they get buffeted, they bounce back. 
the ones that are not flexible, those are the ones that break off. Those are the gigantic trees that land in your, you know, in your front yard that you're having to uh, tear apart with a chainsaw at the end of the hurricane. So I think that's a, that's a really great point. I love that brittle strength. Thanks. Yeah. I think it's what like the liberal arts education is all about, right? You kind of like learn a little bit about everything exactly. so that you can draw lines between these disciplines to kind of understand your own discipline, maybe at even a higher level. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, so I think that concept of, of drawing lines between different disciplines, um, connecting points that at one point may have been disparate, right? Saying, oh, this is, why would I be thinking about this in this situation? Right. Um, so much of that comes from example, from following an example of somebody who's done it before. And yeah. that leads us into listen to your coach, right? Listen to your coach. I think, um, you know, what would it look like if a single student went out and tried to give themselves a liberal arts education with no idea about <laughs> anything? It's like going out into the woods and you walk out there <laughs> with nothing. You say, all right, I'm going to learn. Mm -hmm. And then you, you probably die. You probably die. If you don't have any idea at all about what you can eat, what you can't eat, what you can drink, where's a good place to stay, what animals are around you, all these different things. Yeah. Um, to get away from the forest metaphor, coming back to martial arts, I've been thinking so much since reading this chapter about the people in my life who seem a little bit lost, who seem like they're having a hard time taking those baby steps, even thinking about taking those baby steps and after reading this, I realized, you know, these people don't have a mentor. They don't mm -hmm. have someone who is, is leading them in that way or is committed to leading them in that way and supplying them with objects of consideration of, hey, I saw you do this in this situation. Let's look at that from this lens or let's look at it from here. And I can talk on and on about this, but that's that's what really struck me about this chapter and what I've been thinking about in terms of terms of this one. Yeah, it's. Um, I think we, we're progressively moving into a world of individuality where it's like it's me, 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 and I don't need anyone else. And you know, you look at the families are kind of breaking up in a way. I feel like and. There's not as much respect for your elders as there once was. And I feel like those are really important things that hold us together and remind us that we are small. If we if we think we're the big cheese and everything revolves around us, we're going to make that kind of brittle strength that isn't really uh, truly um, strong. And, you know, I, I see a lot of students coming in and, they you know watch youtube and they, they they're trying to train on their own and all this kind of stuff and i think we all know like those youtube warriors and how far they really get with their with their training it's only once you um sort of submit to the idea that you know nothing and empty your cup and just go out there and say okay i'm here i'm standing here i've shown up what do you want me to do and i'll do whatever you say and i'll say yes sir and when you put yourself in that mindset you, you, you really form some strength. You really form strength. Because if you do it on your own terms and you say, well, okay, I'm here, but uh, I only want to work on these things because these are the things that I think are going to be most effective to me. Uh, you just start shutting all these doors around you that are going to lead you to a higher level of proficiency, a deeper yes. knowledge. Yes. And you're controlling that environment so much that you're, you can't possibly learn anything about tenacity and uh, indomitable spirit. I couldn't agree with you more. I think there's a, there's a couple of aspects to this. I think going back to the very first thing we talked about, about getting in the ring, mm -hmm. I think a lot of times that's motivated while it may seem like arrogance. I think it's motivated by fear. I'm willing to be this risky. I'm willing to learn this much, but this is how I want to learn it. And you, you sort of box it in because that's safe. Mm -hmm. When you have a coach who stretches you, not just because like, I, I know four years old, you can do 75 push-ups. I don't mean stretching you like that. I mean, someone who believes in you. 
and who says, you know what, that box is too small for you. There's a bigger box for you. Let's, let's try this. I think you can do this and not because I'm mean or sadistic because I believe in you more than you believe in yourself. And I think you're so right, sir, about people who don't have that kind of mentorship. They play small and the successes that they have, no matter how great they are, are nothing compared to what they would have if they truly did have a coach who believed in them and loved them and supported them and pushed them and stretched them. Because it's only when you have that, that to your point, sir, that you're willing to bend and stretch and become more. That mere proficiency is not enough. Now it's expertise. Now it's mastery. Now I can do so much more than I ever thought because somebody believed in me. You know, I think about when I, um, so when I tested for my sixth degree black belt in, in our system in, in the Ernie Reyes system, when you test for fourth degree, you're considered a master instructor. Um, but once you're at the fourth degree and above level, it's not a two day black belt test. Like the, the lower ranks you're out in the field and it's a five or a six day test. Mm -hmm. And so my six day test um, we, we went out to California. There's, I don't know, 130 of us from all the schools all around the country. And you have a whole list of things that you're supposed to bring. It's all you're allowed to bring. If you get caught with anything outside that list, your, your team loses points and all of that kind of thing. And so, you know, there was one day that we were, um, I think it was day two and we were told what to wear. So I'm wearing running shoes and I have leggings on and we ha I have my, you know, my t-shirt on. We had a backpack that we had. We had to have our ID in a Ziploc bag with a small flashlight and empty backpack other than that. And so we get in these vans and yeah. you don't know where you're going. So we drive up to the Presidio in San Francisco and all the vans are up there. And we, you know, we get out of the vans and they put two vans together. You're a team. So now there's like, 25 people on a team mm -hmm. and they give us a coach and the coach for each one of the teams was either Delta force, green beret, um, special forces guys from somewhere. We never met these guys. And so of course we're all used to, yes, sir. Yes, sir. And they're screaming at us. Do not call me, sir. I am not an officer. And so you're going, yes, you know, swallowing the sir. Cause you're not allowed. And it got to the point, if you said, yes, sir, they'd make us do pushups. And mm -hmm. um, so we get our team and we go down on the, on the, and this is July in San Francisco. So we're down on the sand. The bay is right there. You know, I don't know, a hundred yards from where we're standing and they show us these big logs and they show us how to pick up the logs. And it takes about eight people to pick up a log. They were between 350 and 400 pounds. So we learn how to carry the logs. We put the logs down and they say, okay, you have three minutes, go down, get completely submerged, get back up here, pick up your log. We're leaving. And you just, okay, you take off, you know, we're fully clothed, backpacks on, dive in the water. And you can imagine, you know, it's July in San Francisco, so it's nice and warm outside, but the bay is freezing. So you come back up, you're soaking wet, you're freezing cold, you pick up the log. Well, we carried those logs for 10 miles throughout San Francisco. Downtown, up hills, you name it, we did it. And at first you're just like, what is happening here? I mean, I've been, this is my third mastery test. I know things get crazy, but like, this is insane. And, you know, you're switching out. And then when you weren't carrying a log, somebody else on your team, which, cause we had two logs per team. So there would be all the people carrying the logs. And then about at the same number of people would be just jogging. And then you'd swap out and you just rotate. And we got into kind of a rhythm where you just rotate, rotate, rotate. Well, we got to this one point where we got to a street and the light had turned red when only one of our logs had crossed the street, the other one hadn't. So by the time we got to the other side of the street, our coach was livid. He's screaming at us, you know, you never ever separate your team. You stay together. Now you have casualties. So we picked the biggest guy on our team. And then they had a stretcher, which is the metal. I mean, this thing's heavy. And he put him on the stretcher. Now you're a casualty. So now the people who were getting a break from the log had to carry the stretcher. 
So <laughs> we're running up and down and stuff. And so we get to this one point in San Francisco where we're on one street down here and there are these big stairs that go up to another street leading up here. So we had us put our logs down. We had to do a bunch of push-ups. We had to do a bunch of flutter kicks. And then he says, okay, you have to bunny hop up the stairs, which is like about two flights of stairs. And then you have to crab walk down the stairs, come back and get your log. So, okay, so we do that. We come back. Everyone's dying. You know, he's like, pick up your log. He's like, okay, take it up the stairs. Mm. And we were just like, okay. And we did it because mm. we had done everything up to that point. This was probably a good eight miles into the thing. So we were actually nearly done. We didn't know it, but we didn't bat an eye because our coach told us to do it because we'd been able to do everything he told us to do up to that point. He didn't say now, I don't know if you guys can make it or not, but I'd like you to go up that hill. He said, pick up your log, go up the stairs. And we just did it. We believed our coach because he'd proven to us that what he saw in us was more than we saw in ourselves. And we we didn't question. We just did something that was outrageous. This huge, huge log, you know, we're differing heights and we're, some of them are carrying them like this. Some of us are carrying them on the shoulders, but you know what? We got to the top of the stairs and then we kept going. Mm -hmm. And when we got back to the Presidio, well, actually shortly after that, we came to a big empty lot and they said, okay, put your logs down. You're done with the logs. And we're like, oh yeah, high fives. You know, this is awesome. This is awesome. Like, okay, now we're going to jog back to the Presidio, which was probably another couple of miles. So we get back to the Presidio and everybody's like, oh, we did it. That was awesome. Ah, you know, and then somebody kind of looked around and went, where's the vans? <laughs> the vans aren't here. And our leaders look at us and go, did you guys think you were done? No, the vans are on the other side of the bridge. You got to run across the Golden Gate Bridge, which fun fact is 2.6 miles. So we jogged from the Presidio to the bridge, jogged across the bridge. And mind you, by now, there are people who are falling out, right? They've got knee problems. They wrenched an ankle, something happened. So we're literally carrying part, you know, some of our team and we're, you know, creating baskets or we're carrying them on our shoulders or whatever. And um, Master Thompson, who's Master Reyes's co-founder, he said to me, Cindy, you're bringing up the rear for your team. Nobody, nobody falls behind. Like, yes, sir. Yes, sir. So we're getting people across. We get across to the end of the bridge and it's, you know, it's nine o'clock at night. You're still wet because you're all sweaty. Plus you never dried off from being in the bay. I've never been so cold in my entire life. And we're all just, you know, shivering, shivering, shivering. I've never been so proud of myself in my entire life. There's nothing. And I will tell you this. This was in 2016 when I tested for six. So I was 55 years old. Mm -hmm. And when we got on the team, I mean, there's some on the team who are 20. And when I walked in, I said, I told myself, nobody on this team is going to have any cause for wishing that they didn't get stuck with the grandma. Like whatever anybody does, I'm doing more. If they ask for volunteers, I'm saying yes. Now, mind you, I already had one titanium knee and I had a, a two bad shoulders. And I was like, you know, no matter what, I'm, I'm doing it. I'm doing it. And sure enough, you know, we got to the end where we were running from the Presidio to the, to the um, bridge and it was so cold and the wind was blowing and these, all the Green Beret guys are pulling out these, those uh, shiny blanket things that you, you know, the thermal blanket things. And they're, they're offering them to the girls. And I'm like, I'm not taking that. No, thank you, sir. And I just kept running. And some of these, you know, 20 year old girls are up. And I'm like, mm -mm, not happening. And there's nobody who can take away those feelings I can never lose those feelings. Like I said, somebody could steal my black belt. You can burn my certificates. Nobody can ever take that feeling away from me standing on the other side of that bridge, knowing not once did I falter, that I not only did my part, I did more, that I didn't take that stupid blanket and that, you know, I was earning every stripe on my belt. Mm. So I know that's a lengthy story, but the point is that the reason we were able to do what we did was because we listened to our coach. Because when we thought we couldn't do it, it never crossed his mind that we couldn't do it. 
he believed in us. And so we learned very quickly how to believe in ourselves. And any time that we can do that for our students, or we can do that for a friend or a family member or a coworker, I mean, that's huge. It's, it's exactly what you said, sir. People who don't succeed to that degree, it's because they don't have a coach who says, I know you're scared. I know this is hard. I also know you can do it. And I'm here with you every step of the way because I believe in you. Let me start off by saying that I've been in the martial arts a long time and I've done all sorts of testings, but that has got to take the cake for the most testing <laughs> I've ever heard. <laughs> like, like ridiculous. Six days too? Oh that was God. only day two of oh the six God. day test. That's so ridiculous. <laughs> but it's amazing. I mean, a, more, I mean, a lot of respect, a lot of respect. Yes, uh, wow. Okay. That was the first thought, but um you know, you say, listen to your coach and, and I'm, and I'm listening to what you're saying. And so true. And I, I almost think people who don't get it might not realize what you're actually saying here is trust in your coach. You yeah. can have a great coach who is patient and, and, and does everything right. But if it doesn't come from you, the trust start in you for your coach, he can't yes. do anything for you. Yep. And it reminded me of this um, study I heard about where there was like a rat and they, or a mouse and they dropped it in water and it tried to swim and it swam for like, I can't remember the exact numbers. Have you guys heard about this study? You see, it, sw it swims sport. for like five minutes or something and then it drowns mm -hmm. and then they they take this they take another rat and they stick it in the water and right before five minutes they pull it out and then they stick it back in and it swims for like 60 hours wow yeah and it's like just shows you the difference between trusting in yourself believing in yourself and not thinking it's possible yeah. and how much that affects whether you can succeed or not mm. wow so i mean yeah and I, I just know personally um i'm pretty you know self-motivated person anyone who starts their own business has to be but even myself um i can't push myself like somebody can push me you mm. know like mm. i need somebody to coach me if i want to achieve a high level of success so true so true we could go on and on. We've gone <laughs> over an hour and 20 minutes talking about uh, this awesome book, and there's still so much more to be said. Where can people pick up your book? Because I definitely want them to, to read it. Yeah, thank you so much. So it's available on paperback on Amazon. Um, it's available hardbound on barnesandnoble.com. And it's available on audiobook um, on audible.com. Um, and a variety of it. You can get it at Kobo. Um, Apple Books. Yep. That's it right here, guys. That's the place. Grandmaster <laughs> Villanueva right there on the back. Um, it's been a pleasure. You know, oh, we really love lovely. your book and your stories and, you know, a big inspiration to, you know, all the women who are studying martial arts, but not just women, men too, you know, um, so, yeah. Well, I have, I have four kids, one girl, three sons, all three boys are black belts. Mm, there you go. Yes, ma'am. Following in the footsteps of their mom. Mm, thank you. Thank you so much for coming on. We hope maybe, you know, we can have you back on sometime in the future to talk about a different topic. And I love it. I wish you the best of luck with all of your things you have going on, your business coaching and all that as well. Thank um, you. Yeah. Absolutely. This was great, guys. Thank you so much. And wishing you guys all the very best in your school and your students and your continued path. Thank you, Thank so you much. for having me. Tosang. If you enjoyed that podcast, please consider liking and subscribing to our YouTube channel, as well as hitting the notification bell. We offer in-person group and private lessons at our facility in Kyle, Texas, as well as virtual lessons anywhere in the world. If you'd like to learn more about our programs, you can find us online at risingphoenixtkd.com.